Radio Network. This is the Mind of the Meanie. Here are your hosts, the Blue Meanie and Adam Barnard. Peace world and welcome everybody to the Mind of the Meanie, your weekly peek into the world according to former WWE superstar and ECW original, the Blue Meanie. We'll cover wrestling, music, movies, sports, and lots and lots of useless knowledge all contained in the Mind of the Meanie. I'm your tour guide, Adam Barnard, and he is the Blue Meanie. Meanie, what's on your mind? Eastbound down, loaded up and trucking. Oh, man. Had a good weekend. Yeah. Had a good weekend uh, last, not last weekend, but the weekend before since a uh, little inside baseball. We're recording Thursday. Yeah. Is it um, Yeah. Uh, I did the uh, old Square Circle Expo in Indianapolis, Indiana. And that was, I'm still kind of buzzing because it was a lot of fun. Yeah. It was a lot of fun, man. Um. Uh, thanks to the folks at Collar and Elbow, uh, Rod Hicks and Al Snow for bringing me out. Uh, use promo code Meany and save ten percent. Uh, my bad. Uh, no, no, it was, it was really cool, man. Um, had a great weekend uh, since we last uh, talked. Uh, did a, a much needed uh, like road trip. Just like um, they booked me. Uh, like, uh, Rod was like, hey, man, what are you doing? I was like, hey, nothing. And then uh, realized, hey, he was like, hey, um, you want to do uh, the Square Circle Expo in Indianapolis? I was like, absolutely. I was like, don't even get me a plane ticket. Just I'll drive on out and drove out and had a blast. Do you, I guess, and I know we've talked about this before, but it sounds like you prefer driving. Than yes. Flying, right. Now, was that pre-COVID as well? Or was that just as like just since COVID's happened? Just, just, I see how people are like, I see how a lot of the boys are getting screwed on their flights. Like I read Twitter and I'm, I'm just reading like horror stories. I think the tipping point was uh, pre-COVID, I had a booking in Ohio somewhere and uh, I'm kicking myself because it's, it's a couple miles away from where the Mothman statue was, I I totally would have told him to take me to it. But, uh, like, the the Ohio, Virginia, board, or West Virginia, board, whatever, whatever. That's not important. But, um, dude, I, I, I wrestled, I drove, and as I was, I was, you know, being driven back to Cincinnati to fly home the next morning, they're driving me to the hotel so I could wake up, fly home. They kept canceling my flights. I kept telling the promoter, hey, they keep canceling my flights for my return. All right, we got you on this flight. So I get to the airport, and I, I was supposed to leave Cincinnati, fly to Chicago, Chicago to Philly. I was supposed to be home at, like, noon on a Sunday. I didn't get home till midnight. Whoa. I was like, dude, all this time I've spent in the airport, I could have drove here. Because I, when, when you're mad and you're stuck somewhere, you're like, how, mu- how long would it take me to drive? Would have would have taken me to drive this distance and you go seven hours i could have done that yeah you know so i told the guy who booked me i was like next time instead of buying me a plane ticket just cover my rental car and because i won't put miles on my car oh uh, fuck that shit uh just uh send me something for the rental car and i'll just drive you know and uh take my time and listen to stuff i want to listen to and uh you know, not have to uh, go all Mike Tyson on somebody on the airplane because they're they're taunting me, but uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, yeah, I just prefer to drive like Philly to, and you know, I'm 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 a little uh, nostalgic because I used to drive to Indiana all the time when I was in um, living in Lima, and then um, you know when I was leaving Lima to come back to moved back to the East Coast. I wrestled. I went from Lima to Indianapolis, wrestled my last gig for Circle City, drove back to Lima, packed my car, drove from Lima, and drove all the way back to Atlantic City just in time to get home and watch, like, UFC 5 or 6 or something because I wanted to watch Dan Severn fight. But I was like, yeah, I'll drive to Indianapolis. It's supposed to be a 10-hour drive. Went out, you know, with stops and all. Ended up being, like, 13 hours, but... It was awesome. It was just like a uh, straight shot. I was going to 
stop off in Lima on this way, on, on the way out, because, you know, I love to go to Cupy Burger there in Lima. And, um, but God damn, man, it takes a fucking hour to get out of Philly. Yeah. Like a 20, a 20 minute, uh, for those not from Philly, we have the Schuylkill Expressway, which, which people call the Scully Kill or whatever, you know, mispronounce it, but, uh, it should, sure it should take, yeah, uh, it should take you 20 minutes to do that drive and just to stop and start. It took us like a good hour, hour yeah. and a half. I was like, it totally killed our timing. I was like, you know, I don't want to get the lime and QP be closed. Right. So uh, we just went straight through to Indianapolis. And, uh, man, the thing I love about a good long drive is it's a good mind eraser. Just, you're just, you know, focused on the road. We're listening to podcasts and uh, just chilling and, you know, doing everything at our leisure. It was so, you know, Mrs. Mina came along. It was, it was so good. You know, just uh, to have a nice, long, uh, therapeutic drive. <laughs> it's always, I always found it very, I always found myself in a, in a much better mood. I know people get angry when they're they're on long car rides, but I always, if we're road tripping, man, I'm like, fuck, let me get behind the wheel. I'm, I want to I wanna just sit and vibe and enjoy the views and enjoy the ride. Yeah. Like, it's just, there's something really cathartic about it in some ways you know and not everything but i know it's like you know courtney and i we were just talking about it today we were still thinking about driving to nashville at some point while i'm on my my leave and it's like you know it well it should would take, it would take us a week to get there but it's like you know what fuck it we might as well do that you know why not like why you know if it ah, takes us well that's, because we have a, an infant now so it you know yes, we have to true. accommodate for that and then the kids it's like as soon as you get in the car Oh, dad, I have to go to the bathroom. It's like, dude, we literally like all the things you see on television are true. Right. About road right. trips with kids. But um, yeah, I mean, so we're like uh, Nashville's a really cool spot and it would be it would be great to to drive down there. But um, <clears throat> so there'd be so much there, there'd be so much cool things to see down there. But yeah, I I, I, I totally took out the equation, the the uh, the child factor of uh, stopping yeah. Yeah. on the drive. But our drive was, you know, pretty uh straightforward is pretty cool it's good so i know you brought not, not to not not to rub it in but <laughs> <laughs> i'll have plenty of drives ahead of me don't you worry uh but i know um i know you guys broke the internet again the other day uh you saw oh your, yeah your mortal enemy jbl so yes. um because you guys have a blood feud that can only be completed with <laughs> it's highlander rules right am i am i recalling yeah. that correctly so yeah. uh we can't be together unless we bleed together that's what it was. Uh, I knew, I, yeah. I knew it was something crossed the lines there. Now, <laughs> the Blackpool Combat Club rules of uh, as a little Jimmy from Nebraska in the room asked, yeah. "How was JBL? JBL was fine. Um, you know, six, we're going 16, 17, 17 years and counting, and uh, people still, yeah, you know, the the smartest fan base in the world doesn't seem to uh, know that. You know, we they didn't get the memo. You know, we've Posted photos together. We I've been on this podcast and uh, yeah, but it was cool, man. It was great seeing him. Uh, it was great seeing um, you know, Ron Simmons, and uh, it. I guess the highlight was uh, Mrs. Meanie's a, a bit of a prankster, a little bit of a ball buster, and she walked up to him and he turned around and she put up her thumb and went boo and just <laughs> start booing him <laughs> and would like run away, so. We're standing around talking. He runs from his room into our room and goes up to Mrs. Me and goes, Boo to you. Right? Yeah, so like imagine this JBL and Mrs. Meanie having a boo war <laughs> over to me. So I, I, oh, it's downstairs. I was gonna show So we're standing there and like we go back to our table. We're off having a sidebar with somebody and go back and Mrs. Meanie goes over to uh, our table. And there's something on the table. If she turns it upside down, and it's JBL dropped off one of his eight by tens with the word "boo" all the way across it for her. <laughs> so uh, she's like, "Son of a bitch, you got me!" <laughs> and um, so we're we're going to frame that for our wall. But I guess the cool thing too, uh, somebody th this was Friday night, and and the the boo war bled over into Saturday. Saturday, but we posted a photo. Uh, Colin Alba took a photo of me and JBL together, posted it. And uh, a fan, a very generous fan, 
uh, printed out the photo on two eight by tens and brought one for me, one for JBL, and we're gonna have that on our. You know, he's gonna have one on his wall. I'm gonna have one on my wall. Oh, so, that's great, man. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah. Fan, uh, fans could be uh, really cool. You know, um, I wish I, the guy gave me his business card. I wish I could give him a shout out, but it's in my uh, my down the hall. But uh, now that no, was cool, man. Uh, just catch it up. I, mean, th- I love doing these conventions because they're like high school reunions. And uh, I had been spoiled for a little bit doing the uh, the Icons Fest here in Philly because it's like 10 minutes from my house and usually you see the same old folks. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but. You know, went out to the, you go out to the Midwest and you get the Midwest talent, you know, uh, and you get to see guys you haven't seen in a while, like Flash Flanagan. Uh, I was hanging out with Wolfie D from uh, PG-13 and mm. th- just reminisce and telling uh, Jamie Dundee stories and just cracking up, you know. You know, good, it was good to, you know, sit with Al and just, you know, bullshit with him and hang Wait, out and talk. Al was there? Yeah, he. Uh, you let him out. He, he, Did you let he, him out? He, 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 I think he picked a lock. Did, uh, you, did you check with Josh? I feel like that was <laughs> part of my contract. I, like, I, all right. Well, I got to make a quick phone. You keep talking. I got to call Josh real fast. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, Al's a shooter, or as we say, uh, a shooter. Um, and uh, I was not going to challenge the man once he once he gets out of the green room. It's, you know. He's like right in front of me. He can tie me into a pretzel if he wanted to. But so you know, I'm you not know. saying oh, I'm, gonna, that, I'm not saying I'm it's like put when, him back. I'm just saying I'm yeah. surprised he got out. That's all. Yeah, yeah. It's like when a bear gets out of the cage, you just kind of stand still and hope he doesn't maul you. You know, just. <laughs> <sighs> oh man! But but yeah, man, had a blast. Had now, a blast. You got something really cool though, didn't you? While you were there. Oh my god! Yeah. Um, let's see. I'll I'll show it for the. If you're not watching, uh, if you're not part of the, uh, the 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 group, go to patreon.com slash mind of the meaning and you can see what I'm about to show the, the folks in the chat. And it is, I was gifted this awesome Andre the Giant uh, WWF promotional 8x10, which is awesome because it, it's a Steve Taylor photo from 1991 Titan Sports. And it was gifted to me by uh, the top Andre the Giant historian historian in the world, Chris Owens. Uh, if you're not familiar with Chris Owens, uh, look him up on Twitter or on Facebook. He was actually uh, an associate producer on the Andre the Giant HBO documentary. Uh, you know, for you know his knowledge of everything Andre the Giant. He came up to me at the convention. He knew, he knows how big of a Andre the Giant fan I am. I mean, I got the Andre the Giant tattoo on my leg, which is, was as awesomely in the Andre the Giant book by uh, uh, Bertrand A. Bear. Hopefully I didn't butcher his name. Uh, and uh, Chris came up to me. He's like, hey, man, I got something for you. And he gave it to me. I'm like, Sarah, I'm like, really? Apparently, and I'm, I'm I'm sure I'm going to butcher this a little bit. He said, uh, you know, Chris drove down to Andre's estate and got the tour and all that stuff toward this, uh, Andre's neighborhood. Uh, and then, you know, Andre, to help out the locals in the neighborhood, would just do a, a pop-up signing and sign all the stuff and, you know, do sign autographs and give the money to the the store people like whoever you sign to you help you know do fundraisers so he asked wwe to send down like some promotional eight by tens and they sent like these eight by the ones i just shared for the patreon group uh a stack of these eight by tens and he while he was down there taking the tour they gave him a couple wow and chris owens uh, I'm going to say his full name because I love the guy <clears throat> was kind enough to put one. It's like in a plastic sleeve and a protective sleeve and everything walked up to my table, gave it to me. And I just went over and gave the man a hug. Wow. And he, he told me the story of it and it was amazing. You know, um, you know, some people can do things and keep it all to themselves, you know, like, oh, I, I can't, I mean, going to share this, but he, 
when I was waiting to come to the convention, find me and give me this Andre the Giant eight by ten, knowing how much I love Andre the Giant, and uh, you know, I always I already had uh, a huge respect for Chris Owens, but uh, man, the guy's golden. He's even more golden in my book now for uh, this this kind of generous offering that he gave me with this Andre eight by ten, which uh, you know Andre had requested from WWE to send down to. You know, uh, LRB, North Carolina, where he lived, and uh, you know, brought one back for me, man. That it's wow. I, I, flabbergasted or uh, stunned. You know, I had a loss for words. I I, I just gave the guy a hug. I was like, man, thank you so much. That's really cool, man. I um, yeah. I finally got a, if you want to get a, if you want to go and follow Chris right now, go ahead and uh, find him on Twitter. It's Chris Owens, nineteen seventy three. So it's one nine seven three. Chris Owens, 1973. Um, but he's got a great Twitter feed. Lots of great information here. I finally got a chance to watch that HBO documentary. I don't know. I, I'm really far behind on stuff, I guess, just because of everything in my life. But I yeah. finally got a chance to watch that. And wow. Like, what an incredible HBO documentary. Like, really, it was very well done. Um, yeah. Really, lots of great information in there. I didn't realize how sort of this broad his life was, you know, just so much information there so if you haven't seen it yet go definitely go out of your way to to take a look at it but um, to talk about that for a second um yeah like back in the 90s a and e did a a and e biography on andre which i still love and yeah. I, I actually i found a commercial version of the vhs which i still have somewhere uh but yeah i love that but like i watched the the hbo documentary and uh you know yeah, Hogan gets a lot of scrutiny for you know t- his storytelling, whether some of it's true or not. But artistic parent- license, yes, yeah. But a lot, you know, him and Vince pretty much tell the same story about how Andre was messing with Hogan on WrestleMania three, and how he wrote out, kind of wrote out the match on a, a a legal tablet. And I think they showed a legal tablet in the documentary, but like as Andre. Hogan's telling the story about how he, you know, uh, wrote out the match, gave it to Andre, and he's reciting stuff. I found myself getting emotional. Yeah. You know, during that scene where, you know, WrestleMania three, where Andre, Andre didn't have to lose. I mean, no. you don't want, if a guy like him doesn't want to lose, he won't lose. Uh, but the fact that he knew it was right for the business and pass that torch to Hogan and knowing physically what Andre the giant was going through with his back and everything, all his aches and pains of, you know, with his, uh, agrimalia, uh, you know, this giant, this giant's disease, uh, man, you watch that body slam and you watch Andre take the body slam and you just watch his face as he's selling it. And you know, that's a, that's a real sell. That's a, that's not a, Oh, I'm selling, selling. That's a shoot sell. Right. You know, he slam me, boss. Slams him. Boom. Leg drop. One, two, three. You know, and Andre gave back to the business. But uh, such a great documentary. And, uh, I'm, uh, you know, it was awesome that Chris got to be a part of it. Chris was, Chris was also on um, the WWE uh, Lost Treasures series or uh, where they go around looking for different stuff, and they showed his – is Andre man cave and uh, mm. dude, that that was so cool. Yeah. You know, the, the yeah. stuff he has and the, the love he has for Andre. And I, like I, I've said before, and I'll say it again real quick, but um, I identified with Andre just, you know, but you know, when he was a baby face, he was lovable and, you know, larger than life. But then you hear a story and how he felt so different, you know, because of his giant, you know, being a giant, you know, and uh, growing up as a kid with asthma, I felt so different than the other kids. And, uh, you know, while the other kids are at recess, you know, my grandfather's bringing my uh, nebulizer machine and I'm, I'm having to sit in the cafeteria, you know, with my medicine, you know, sitting there, you know, breathing it in. And the kids are coming in from recess after having fun and they're watching me with this machine, you know, you know, breathing in my medicine, you know, you kind of feel like a fish in a fishbowl sometimes. You know, with just people staring at you. And, you know, I, of course, Andre was, you know, on a much grander scale. But, uh, you know, I, I just totally identify with, you know, being like an outcast outsider, 
you know, watching that documentary. And that's why I, I have this love and admiration for Andre. Yeah, it's um, unfortunately, or I guess fortunately, I, I can't, I don't, I don't share that sentiment because I, I never had those kinds of issues, but I, I can definitely see yeah. how that would be connected tissue for you. For yeah. Sure. Yeah, man. He, uh, and, and just to see the love Andre got, you know, through the uh, Andre the Giant has a posse uh, thing, which uh, I guess his family didn't really appreciate it. But, you know, as a fan of Andre, I was like, oh, this is awesome, you know. Yeah. Seeing Andre's face all over the world. But, uh, yeah, just uh, it's pretty cool that in 2022, Andre passed away in, what, 92, 93? 93, I think it was, yeah. Yeah, it was such a large, no pun intended, it was such a, a big death that, like, even the local, well, I was living in Lansing at the time, the, the local newspaper covered it with a photo. I was like, oh, my God, you know. Yeah. You know, he's, he's, he's pop culture. He's a, you know. A reference. Oh, look at this Andre the Giant over here. You know, just you know stuff like yeah. that. So yeah, yeah. Got got. And you know, every now and then I'll call somebody boss out of uh, my love. You know, hey, what's up, boss? You know, because Andre called everybody boss. So, uh, but, you know, big uh, shout out to Andre. Big love to Andre. You know, yeah. Always. always I no, no, I, I, I had a secondary thought. I didn't mean to cut you off there. No, no, it's fine. Yeah. This is the mind of the meaning. Yeah. Go, please. Feel no. Free to cut me off. Yeah. yeah. I was fortunate enough to, uh, you know, get to see Andre wrestle, you know. Um, oh, lucky. First, first show I ever went to was, uh, main event was Andre, Jules, and Jay Strongbow against Fuji Saito and Blackjack Mulligan. I was just reminiscing about this the other day, and Andre walks by after the match. I pat him on the belly. And I was like, I'm never going to wash my hand again. <laughs> You know, oh <laughs> so, so just you know, Afro Andre too. That's my favorite. Oh, Andre. Wow, but wow, yeah. So, but uh, yeah. Shout out to Andre. I love you, buddy. I uh, I'm familiar with Andre because I remember we we started young. I was well, I mean I was born in '85, so I remember watching the WrestleMania tapes and you know some of the other tapes we get from Clyde's Video Store in Levittown, and <laughs> you know starting back from the very beginning and watching it forward and being familiar with Andre you know, in the singlet and the, you know, the, the, the Ted DiBiase storyline. That's really how I knew him. Um, so that's Ted all. Ted DiBiase. <laughs> I was just reading too. I mean, I, I, you know, they recognize his title reign and they don't recognize DiBiase's, even though they build him as, as the champion in some events. And he, I think he defended against Bam Bam Bigelow too. Right. Am I recalling that yeah. correctly? He, then I think the very next day, uh, Andre and Ted DiBiase wrestled Bigelow and somebody at the Philadelphia Spectrum. Yes. I think, I, I th and uh, there was a show in Philly, I believe a show in Boston, mm. where uh, DiBiase came to the ring with wearing the belt and they addressed him as a uh, new WWF champion until, you know, Jack Tunney came out and said, eh, eh. Yeah. Can't Unfortunately, buy the, title, the Yeah. Unfortunately, the title is, you know, uh, vacant and will be just, you know, <laughs> I was trying to do my best Jack Tony. I botched it. But <laughs> yeah. I, um, I, I, the only thing I can compare that to is just thinking about like the very first live show I went to, I got to see, you know, like I mentioned before, Randy Savage and, and Razor Ramon in the main event. So for me, that was like, holy shit. You know, this is crazy. fucking kids, man. Fucking born in 85, motherfucker. <laughs> I'm a young buck, pal. Yeah. No, it's uh that's really cool. I would have loved to have seen Andre live. I uh I God, I can't even imagine how I would have reacted seeing him. But I guess one question I want to get before we transition off of this, because we do have a lot of ask me any questions. So I want to start that a little bit earlier in the show today because there's a lot of meat and a lot of good things we can talk about here. But you had mentioned that Hogan catches some flack about some of the things that he says with his creative license. Was there ever any question, because I'm curious, again, like we, we always talk about, I'm perpetually curious about these things. Was there ever anybody that called into question his retelling of the story at WrestleMania 3, or was it always pretty much like, no, this definitely happened this way? Uh, you take Hogan at his word, and then you just listen to other people talk about it, and, there, you know, other people, you know, uh, verify that, you know, yeah, uh, Andre was very nonchalant about the match and it was just like either playing cards or playing dominoes. He's like, uh, you know, Hogan's like, yeah, hey, you want to go over to match? Oh, later. Yeah. You know, 
okay, Andre. Yes, sir. You know, yes, sir. Just, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, like, it's one thing for Hogan to say, but then it's, you know, another thing for other people to, you know, back up the claim that, you know, Andre was kind of having fun with Hogan and stuff like that. Even Vince, I think, said, you know, you know, Andre was just like making Hogan sweat about it, you know, because it was literally the biggest WrestleMania at, up to that point, you know. Yeah. WrestleMania one was important because Vince pushed all his chips up on the table. Yeah. You know, his, you know all his poker chips up on the table and said, all right. And, uh, you know, if WrestleMania one had not done well, there would be no WWF. So right. he would have failed. I mean, he literally, he invested money. He didn't even have, he's like, this is it. Yeah. This is all I have. This is everything I have. I'm putting it all yeah. on the line for this event. And it, I mean, it paid off for him, but do you think that the Hogan and Andre event, was more meaningful in the scope of wrestling than say like a rock and Austin or even a Lesnar reigns, you know, this most, this past WrestleMania. Do you think it's a, it's a, it was a large, cause you know, they always bill everything as they build Lesnar and reigns as the biggest match of, of WrestleMania history. And it's like, well, is it like comparatively to these other ones, which, which do you think is more of an important match in the, well, the, definitely, the of, of wrestling? Yeah, definitely Andre Hogan because if that doesn't well, that do, if that doesn't do well, the company doesn't exist. Like right. all those early WrestleManias, you know, WrestleMania one through three. If one of them, you know, shits the bed, the yeah. company could go under. You know, and you know their business did pretty good all the way up until you know, um, you know, uh, Hogan started losing his uh, appeal as a baby face. But then, you know, the steroid trials really hurt, you know, the company as far as, you know, attendance and stuff like that to where, you know, I talked to, uh, what, you know, when I was in WWE 98 to 2000, I was talking to one of the photographers. So he's like, yeah, we did a show in San Francisco and it cost us more to pay the union. They ran a union building and it cost more to pay the local union workers than they drew at the gate wow. or something like that. Yeah, because wow. they had that they had to load it, you know, you know, pay the union people to load in and all that stuff. It, they actually wound up, you know, going into the red on a lot of shows, and they were running high school gyms and stuff like that just because they couldn't afford the big arenas at one point. And then, you know, they start making a little bit of a comeback, and then it wasn't until like Stone Cold Steve Austin started catching on, and the, the whole attitude there. Well, and the Mike Tyson. Yeah. They brought in Tyson, which brought new eyes to the product. But then, you know, Stone Cold, you know, three, Austin 316 and all that, that saved the company as well. So, you know, there's, there's definitely uh, points where the company could have easily just, you know, ceased to be. You know, but that, that Andre Hogan match took WWE to the next level. Yeah. I think the hyperbole gets a little crazy sometimes, you know, with the, the, the biggest match of all time and Tony Khan's announcements and everything's going to be a huge game changer. Yeah. It's like, guys, we got to, by saying these things so many times, it's like when you watch breaking news on local television, when you say it so many times, it's like, well, I'm not sure that's really how that works now. You know, it's like the, it, the mystique and the appeal and the excitement is gone. What, what's the term? Selling wolf tickets, is it called? I Something think so. Like Something like that, yeah. I mean, don't yeah. get me wrong. Like, it was a, definitely a big event. But for me, yeah. as, a, as a fan, like, and I think the way they built the storyline, you know, it's like, well, we, we already know where this is ending, right? Like, we know yeah. Roman Reigns is going to take the title. So, yeah. for me, the exciting matches were, like, the ones that I was like, yeah, this really paid off in ways that I really wanted it to was Becky and Bianca and Cody and Seth because you... Yeah, kind of had an idea that Cody was coming, but you didn't know until he showed up. And it was like, oh, fuck, this is way bigger for me. Um, But I know, you know, Becky and Bianca, that shit was fucking flawlessly executed, that match. So, yeah, um, I know there's been some discourse recently. Let's talk about this. And then I want to ask your opinion about something in AEW, because I feel like we talk about WWE a lot, but we don't necessarily yeah. talk about AEW too much. Uh, but we'll get there. Um, who do you think? is better position. I mean, I know I've heard a couple of different voices about this. I know Jim Cornette was talking about it and, you know, several other voices in, in wrestling were, but um, do you think that, you know, Cody's going to be the one to, to unseat Roman? I mean, it feels like that's the right move based on what the storyline is going and where things are heading. 
do you think it's going to be Cody that will unseat Roman? Or do you think it's going to be somebody else? It's hard to tell, man, because they're, they're, they're doing a really good build with with the whole Roman thing. And, uh, you know, they, they, it's been pretty flawless. You know, it's just a matter of it's kind of like, you know, the Goldberg streak. You, you don't want to end it on the wrong note. And, you know, the way they ended up Goldberg streak was kind of like, eh, you know. like, like a wet fart. Yeah. Yeah. You, you don't want to end the Roman thing on, you know, the wrong on the, the uh, on a sour note, you know, because it, it's built and built and built and built. It's just got to be done the right way. And I know I, I'm sound, sounding cliche, but it's just like right moment, right circumstances, right time, better pizza, Papa John's. <laughs> um, <laughs> ah, so I'm about the cadence. I don't know. It, it worked. Uh, it absolutely worked. So well done, <laughs> sir. A tip of the cap to you, sir. Yes. Um, but yeah, it, could he? Sure. But how long are they going to let the, uh, the storyline go right? and let it build and, you know, let it breathe and marinate and age like a, like a fine wine, so to speak. But, uh, I mean, it looks like they could be aiming towards that way, you know, with the, uh, you know, Cody building in the promo of trying to win the belt. His dad couldn't right? try trying to achieve the goal. His father couldn't. Right. You know, showing the photo of Dusty with the WWF belt in, back in 77. And, well, Thethon, I didn't really win the belt because champion, champion's advantage, you know, baby. Uh, baby Cody. Um, if it's done right, I, I could see it happening, but I'm here for the ride. Yeah. You know? I don't you know, really, I'm definitely I here for the ride. Really don't want them to rush this. I really, no. and I know I've been seeing a lot of chatter online about it, and it's like, oh, well, Cody, he's fighting uh, The Miz, and he's fighting fucking Seth Rollins again, and man, he's fighting Kevin Owens. It's like, this is exactly what he should be doing. Yeah. You know, I, I don't remember who, well, maybe it was, maybe it was, uh, it was a friend of the show, uh, Eric Bischoff, who said, like, you, you want this to ride. Like, I prefer to see him win some, lose some, be like, or no, it was Sala Monster. That's who it was. It was Sala Monster. He was talking about, I'd rather see him win and lose and go through this trial and, uh, and trials and tribulations before he gets to Roman and make yeah. it really mean something because he could lose a bunch of times and then all of a sudden he beats Roman and then it's this totally huge payoff. You know, I, I feel like that for me is the right move, but I uh, look, uh, I look at the, what they look at what they did with uh, uh, Becky and uh, Bianca. Yeah, same thing, same concept. Dude, fans were so, so pissed. I, Me I hate, hate to pat. I, I I I hate to pat myself on the back, and I wish I didn't. I, like I said a bunch of stuff on Twitter, and I deleted it just because I I got tired of my notifications going off. But I was like, look, this is this is going to end up at WrestleMania. You know, oh, they dropped her out in thirty seconds. Blah, blah. I was like, yeah, and that's going to be much more sweeter when she wins the belt back down the line. No, no, they're the big insider words. Oh, I know more <laughs> than you. Uh, blah, 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 you know, and just like, dude, I was like, I got, I got to turn my, I got to fucking delete this shit. I'm tired of fucking being yelled at. Yeah. yeah. And I went to look for it, you know, after WrestleMania, to, you know, just to retweet, but to go, <clears throat> I but told uh, yeah, you so. Yeah, I should have fucking. I wish I didn't delete those fucking tweets, but, but yeah, it's just things are done for a reason, and they they Becky and uh, Bianca had a, a really good solid was SummerSlam to WrestleMania run. Yeah, well, with, with a bunch Slam, of yeah, SummerSlam to WrestleMania. Yeah, yeah, a bunch of different little sidebars in between, and that's what you got to do with Cody. You can't have it constantly focused constantly roaming and cody every week kind of have to have these little sidebars to distract you from it so when you go back to it you're like oh yeah right that thing yeah okay kind of like when somebody sets up a table spot <laughs> they set up a table and they brawl around and then eventually they get back to going through through the table that they had set up earlier you know kind of thing so little jimmy said here uh becky and bianca should have gone on before austin and owens honestly dude i 110 percent agree 
I absolutely agree. But I also feel like they staggered that show in a really well done way because, yeah. you know, you had the big pop, then you had a the little bit of a let up, then you had the big pop, and you, have a little, you know, by the time you get to Austin and Owens, if you were to do like, you know, Seth and, and Cody back to back to back, Seth, Cody, uh, Bianca, Becky, and then Austin and Owens, crowd's going to be fucking dead crowd's going to be super dead you know like you want to make sure it it staggers so i felt like it did the right way but i don't necessarily disagree with that so yeah. one of the other things i don't disagree with blue meanie is the blackpool yeah. combat club the new yes. stable inside of aew which has made me excited about a stable in aew for the first time john moxley brian danielson and wheeler yuda managed by william regal holy santa claus shit i <laughs> fucking love it I fucking love everything about this. What does the blue meanie feel like? And how does the blue meanie feel about the com the Blackpool Combat Club? I love it. I love it. I, I love, you know, Will William Regal uh being back in uh pro wrestling. Um I love, you know, I was watching last night, he was on the uh, the commentary. It was great, you know. And I like how they're uh bringing in Wheeler Yuta, you know. So they had kind of have like some vets and some young blood and stuff like that. And, you know, Wheeler's from Philly, so more power to him, too. What he's, up, dude? He's way, he's way over with me for that. But, um... <laughs> Put yeah. him over, meanie, pal. Put him over. Yeah, it's just got to just learn and not to make it too big. You know, three members is good. Four, okay, but don't make it too, too big, you know. I've always longed for a, a good varsity club type fucking you know, uh, faction, you know? Yeah. To me, that, that, that was such a great faction back in the day. You know, we had Steve, uh, Steve Williams, Mike Rotundo, Rick Steiner. Oh, with their varsity jackets and with Kevin Sullivan as the manager. And then uh, I guess the closest to come to that was, you know, team angle. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But now you got the, uh, the Blackpool combat club. I, I dig it. I dig the vibe. I dig the wrestlers in it. Uh, hopefully it just doesn't get too big and uh, hopefully it, you know, they don't disband it. You know, it seems like that's the big thing, you know, you know you'll start a faction and give it a name and then disband it within months, you know, right. Again, let it breathe, you know, just it's pro wrestling. You could be, you could be whatever you want. Uh, just uh, again, when it comes to them, I'm, I'm here for the ride. You know, uh, I want to see where it goes. I was just thinking the same thing. I really wanted to, I really want this to do well. I really wanted to breathe. I think there's a lot of opportunity for them to do this, especially if they're blurring the line between that, you know, face and heel kind of scenario. If they start getting into that territory, I think yeah. that could be super dope. But uh, Andrew Bailey had a great recommendation. Why not bring in Virgil? Uh, They don't have to bring in Virgil. Virgil will just show up. He doesn't. Yeah, they don't bring in Virgil. Bur Virgil brings himself. That's Him how and this his works. balls. And his meat his sauce. Ball. And his ball poking out through his shorts. <laughs> I am uh, I'm I, very I, excited I, I, to see that. Don't forget to check out Dynamite. They're going to be in Philly this week. If you're in the Philadelphia region, they're going to be in Philly coming up on Wednesday the 27th at the Leah Core Center. Tickets are still available now, so go ahead and check them out. It's going to be a great event. Always a good time to go to a live wrestling event. Meanie. Yes. Would you like to ask Meanie? I would love to. It's time to ask Meanie anyway. Ask me something. Don't forget to tweet us your questions at Mind of the Meaning using the hashtag AskMeany and find us on Facebook. Follow us, facebook.com slash Mind of the Meaning, and you can ask us your questions there. We have a shit ton of questions this week yeah. uh, for Ask Meany. Go ahead. What do you got today? And, and, and full disclosure, I found a, a, a container of, of the ugly drinks, uh, the CVS up the road here in Downingtown. I'm going to grab them for next week, so I'll have them in the fridge, and they'll only be for Mind of the Meaning. But Meany, what do you have today on tap? I have a polar uh, seltzer. <laughs> this one's called Werewolf Howls. Ooh. What flavor is it? Uh, we like, shall see, but yeah. let me open it up. All right, we're going to say I'm in that shit in three, two, one. There we go. Seltzery yeah. goodness. It's All purple, right. so let's see what it is. Yo, man, you know I'm good at purple. Everything purple is fucking fantastic. So... Like I said, don't forget, tweet us your questions, twitter.com slash mind of the meanie, 
and use the hashtag Ask Nini. We'll start at the top here. Speaking speaking of road trips, yeah, how is it? Is it good? It's kind of grape. It's yeah. like a little bit like grape, but I, it's pretty good. I am uh, I am going to the first question here from Ivan River. Speaking about road trips, Meanie, what's the best yes. non wrestling road trip you've ever been on? Oh my god, um, dude, like uh, I'm trying to think of non wrestling road trips. Um, I I was doing a, a series of movies for a guy named Len Kabasinski out of Erie, PA. And uh, a lot of times, you know, I would have to drive up to Erie from Philly and talk about good, like, mind ra- erasing trips. You know, uh, Len would be like, hey, man, I got this movie. You want to you know, come out and do something? Sure. You know, hop in the car, drive up uh, the Northeast Extension, you know, cross over on I-80, drive up to Erie, and uh, just hang out, you know. And uh, Len's a good dude. He would always, you know, have, you know, in his early days, have me in his movies. And we just hang out and have a good time. Um, and uh, more, and that was like early, you know, 2006, 2007. Uh, but another one that we recently just did was, uh, and before the lockdown, uh, we went to Toronto, Canada. Well, we we we're, we're trying to do like a one Eagles away game, Philadelphia Eagles away game a year, you know, just you know, just to give us a chance to go to a new city and just hang out. And uh, when the Eagles went up to play the Buffalo Bills, which was like right around Halloween, so uh, I have a a buddy, uh, Chris Tidwell, the, you know, the notorious TID, he uh, wrestles up in the you know, Toronto area, and he's a big Philadelphia Eagles fan, so, uh, you know, I got his tickets, and then, like, a couple days before the game, drove up to Toronto, hung out in uh, Canada for a couple days, uh, celebrated Halloween in Canada, which was pretty cool. Oh, that's cool. Uh, yeah, they, they had a local uh, Halloween get-together at some hall. It was really fun, and then that Sunday, we... Got up, went to the game, and then uh, from the game, you know, you know, a game, you know, the Eagles fortunately won. And uh, the cool thing about that game was uh, Joey Belladonna from Anthrax sang the national anthem, which was like bizarre and awesome at all at the same time. So uh, you know, we we went there. And it was like a fucking windstorm, but it was rainy and windy. But and it, it would have should have sucked, but it was actually a, a good time. And we loaded up the car, uh, and before we came home, we found, like, a, a local Tim Hortons and loaded up on uh, some you know, cans of Tim Tim Hortons coffee to bring home back to Philly. And uh, we were driving back to Philly, and, like, you know, Eagles fans travel well, right? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> like, we, we were stopping along the way, and we kept stopping at rest stop and running into Eagles fans. So I get back to Philly, and, uh, you know, I drop off Mrs. Me, unload the car, go to look for parking. And then, um, there's a lot near me, which, uh, I'll park at if like when I tap out with trying to, you know, find parking on my street or in and around my street, like I, I there's this lot, like it's like a 15 minute walk. So I, I go and park in the lot as I'm walking, there's a guy in the Eagles area. He's like, were you? Were, were you at the Buffalo Bills game too? I was like, yeah. It's like, it's, it was almost like a cannonball run from yeah. Buffalo to Philly. And it just happened to park, you know, a couple spaces over for somebody who was also at the game and sat, you know, yeah, we both pretty much got to South Philly at the same time. So it was like, almost like we were having a race that we didn't know we were involved in. But anytime, you know, you know, uh, we, we did a Eagles game, the, the London, which also fell on Halloween. We did Halloween in England and stuff like that. So, you know, hopefully when the, the world heals up a little bit better and we can start trying to do that tradition again, you know. Uh, but, yeah, they, it, working for Len, you know, up in Erie, which doesn't sound extravagant, but it, it was a good time. It was fun, you know. Yeah. And uh, doing a Halloween and the Eagles game up in, you know, up in the Canada area was a lot of fun. Dave McSnotling asked, when the blue... What? Yeah, that's his name on Facebook. Blue or Dave McSnotling. 
Um, when the Blue World Order came about, did you choose to be the blue guy? And if so, why? Did you all choose your characters, or were they suggested by others? Thanks from England. Uh, it, it was like a 10-minute process <clears throat> where we're like, yeah, we'll be the blue, you know, blue world order and me stevie raven and nova were standing around and uh it, it, it pretty much just came to you know look at the nwo look at the nwo and look at us and go in height order <laughs> who's the tallest stevie okay he could be kevin nash uh i'm the second tallest so i could be scott hall and then, you know, in Nova was Hogan. But it also uh, made sense because, you know, uh, when me and Stevie were, uh, well, I was the heart attack kid as Shawn Michaels, and Stevie was Diesel. So he already been oh, like a Kevin Nash. Right. He, he already been like a Kevin Nash character. So this time he can relive that, redo that role as Kevin Nash. You know, I could be the Scott Hall, you know, oozing blue cheese mo, and uh, <laughs> Hogan. <laughs> I'm gonna get that tattooed on my wrist, <laughs> oozing blue cheese mo. I love it. I I brought up that line to Paul, and I want to say at the Allentown Fairgrounds, and he fucking popped. I'm like, sure. I'm oozing blue cheese mo, man. Just like, and he was just like, "Oh, you got, you got to use that." <laughs> if you don't use that blue mini, excuse me, sir. I, if uh, I may, sir. Yes. Oh but uh God. oozing blue cheese mo. Uh yeah, it just it's just, <laughs> just a matter of size order, really. You know, yeah. and it just made sense that, you know, Kevin I mean uh Stevie did two iterations of uh Kevin Nash characters. Uh let me see. Let's go to another one here. Joshua Kuhn says, Do you find the landscape of wrestling today more accepting of your style of entertaining the fans? More gimmick wise, it seems today something like the Blue World Order would have had a bigger push and a larger reach. I personally think it would have highlighted guys like you and Al Snow in a bigger light. In today's landscape? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we come from the 90s landscape, you know, where, you know, we got to, you know, basically do the same thing, you know, 20 years ago. So uh, I think it's accepted now because we did it back then. You know what I'm saying? Just... Um, you know, uh, my character, I thought my character was a couple years too late. You know, my, I think my character would have been perfect in the 80s. You know, where you had George the Animal Steel, you had the Missing Link. You know, you know, like, larger than life, you know, uh, oddball misfit characters, you know. You know, uh, shit. I, I, thought, I thought they eventually would have put me in the oddities or something like that, you know. But, uh, yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. That, that was a that feels like that feels like a miss. Blue Mini should have definitely been in the oddities. I don't know. Or you know, I had a couple of, a cup of coffee in the miss uh, uh, in the uh, uh -huh. cup of coffee in the oddities. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, uh, but you know, uh, I think it's acceptable today because it was acceptable back then. Um. And, you know, no, there's nothing really truly ever new in wrestling. It's just recycled stuff, you know. Yeah, you know, just, you know, I love when, you know, somebody will bust out a Bret Hart spot and they'll do a split screen between whoever's doing it today with Bret Hart doing it back then. It's almost done, you know, move for move as a you know tribute to Bret. But, you know, what's old is new. And, uh, you know, is it more acceptable in, in this landscape? It, it's acceptable, but, you know. I'm I, I'm just talking in circles right now, but yeah, it's it's acceptable now because it was acceptable way back then. You know, I remember. Uh, you know, we we start we were, we're known for the parodies, but hey, you know, I remember um, Terry Funk doing a parody of Ric Flair in the NWA. You know, he put on a blonde wig and he you know called Flair banana nose and all this stuff and just you know, I've seen parodies in wrestling. Is this we kind of like ran with the ball you know took the ball and ran with it got a couple more questions for you here andrew reynolds wants to know in your honest opinion besides stevie and nova 
Who did you have the most fun with in your career? Uh, Tracy Smothers. Uh, and, uh, dude, yeah, I talked about how we did the uh, Square Circle Expo over the weekend. All of us had our Tracy Smothers stories and stuff like that and how much we loved him. But Tracy was great, you know. Uh, you know, just, uh, you know, between the, the pre show workouts and just the little things he would do during a match that would just pop you and stuff like that. And, the, you know, the FBI, you know, him and Guido were a blast. So, you know, uh, I, I'm assuming he's, he means in the ring and out of the ring, but, you know, in, in and out of the ring besides, you know, Stevie Nova and Al Snow, because Al Snow, I, I, you know, I've, I've had a, I was fortunate enough that he was my trainer. We were together in ECW. We were together in WWE, you know, with the job squad. Um, Yeah, it would have to be, you know, a a toss-up between Al Snow and and Tracy Smothers. Bob Porter wants to know, favorite comedy promos or angles with the Blue World Order or involving anybody else in ECW or any interesting or funny sinister minister memories? Big fan. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Um, and thanks for the question. Bob yes. Bob. You know, that's why I, I love doing the, the ask Meanie because it, it helps you know, shake loose some memories. I forget about Uh favorite promo with the, uh, the BWO, um, probably had to be, uh, the BWO in times square for Christmas. Uh, just because that's the epitome of just run and gun filming. You know, uh, you know, we didn't have any permits to film in New York. All right, just go stay, go stand by the tree, do a couple poses, stand by the ice rink, do a couple poses, go up to the street performer singing this thing, grab the mic, sing in it, break the guy's fucking boom box and run off, which wasn't intentional, but you know, you know, uh, yeah, probably, uh, BWO in Times Square for Christmas because, you know, every year, you know, people, you know, uh, post that and, and tag me in it. And uh, just the stories behind it, you know, uh, we had the street performing Santa Claus who <clears throat> was just standing there and he was like, I, uh, I want to be on TV. All right, can you take a Stevie kick? <laughs> and we explained the Stevie <laughs> kick. And the one that aired uh, during that segment on uh, ECW Hardcore TV was like the second bump he took. Like, wow. We did we we did it twice and the guy took a flat bag bump on concrete Oof. and didn't even did I, did I do good yeah you did great uh bye I mean, I just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah just yeah this guy just wanted to be on tv and uh took a bump like a like a champ wow. but um that's probably my favorite you know it, unfortunately you know when uh the cock, the peacock, they don't have the original music, but, uh, you know, it, it's up there on YouTube and people share it every year. Uh, let's see. Let's go back to here. We got two more today. It looks like Gregory White wants to know, Meanie, what is the story about the rubber chicken in the Memphis area? <laughs> Pop. <laughs> yeah, the rubber chicken in the Memphis area. That sounds like code for something. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you got someone that, uh, you, you, you know what I'm talking about? You remember the rubber chicken in the Memphis area? You know what I'm talking about? Uh, excuse me, sir. I'll have your finest rubber chicken in the Memphis area. Uh, <laughs> sounds like a Yelp review. Um, <laughs> oh, my God. So, yeah, um, WWE sent a bunch of us down to Memphis. Me, uh, Reckless Youth, uh, R-Truth. Uh, and a few others. And uh, Jim DeAnvil Neidhart was uh, the trainer or coach down there before Regal came down because then Regal came down and kind of took over. And uh, Jim's a character. Jim Jim DeAnvil Neidhart's a character. I love Jim DeAnvil Neidhart. Uh, They tagged us up. Um, I was trying to do the thing where I was like, we could be the new heart foundation. I could be your Brett kind of thing. And, um, you know, we, we were a team for a little bit. So 
we were doing a show. I'm trying to think of the name of the town in Arkansas. Might have been Blytheville, Arkansas. And uh, who, who, the people running Memphis Championship Wrestling really didn't put any fucking time or effort into promoting the fucking shows. Because we were supposed to go down there to, you know, it's developmental territory to work on new shit. You know, because I was trying to do a new character. Work on new shit in a, in a small environment where you can make all the mistakes you want and it really doesn't hurt you because it's not on national TV. But you also need fans in the crowd to work in front of. So it was one of these shows where we're just, you know, we're doing Blyville, Arkansas every Wednesday or Thursday. And the first time we went, the, the crowd was like huge because, you know, that Jerry Lawler, Jerry Lawler on the card. Each and every week, it just got slow, lower and lower and lower and lower to the fact that where it felt like it just, we're driving an hour just to do a gym show in front of nobody. So, um, me and Reckless Youth, you know, we love Jim. We just got the idea to uh, play a little rib on him. You know, just because you know, we're, we're so, I mean, we're away from home. Uh, we're hoping to get back up. You know, well, I'm hoping to get back up to the WWE. You know, Reckless is hoping to get up to the main roster. Uh, and, you know, Jim's a character. And, uh, you know, so we, we're in Blyville, Arkansas, and Reckless Youth is wrestling Jim the Anvil Neidhart. And uh, I'm, they want me to come out and, you know, do something. Like, I'm, I'm like, I'm like, Chris Farley, you know, and, you know, uh, Jim's the, like the straight lace guy. So they want me to do a thing where, you know, I go to throw, uh, Jim, the anvil, Nightheart a weapon. He goes to pick it up and, you know, instead of, you know, grabbing the weapon and turn around and hit youth with it, youth rolls them up real quick for a quick one, two, three. So we're, we're at the building in Blytheville and it's just like, um, uh, or I, I was like, I mean, you, Jim's like, oh, what are you going to throw at me? I was like, I don't know. I got to find a, I got to find something. I didn't pack anything. I don't have a chain or the, you know, maybe I'll slide a chair in or something like that. And then he's like, all right, just, just figure it out. You know, you know, you're, you're just giving it to me for me to get rolled up. All right. So, uh, you know, the match is going on. He's got reckless youth down for a second. You know, reckless is kind of making a comeback. He cuts him off. I go to run out. And from underneath my shirt, I go, Jim, Jim, hit him with this. And I, from underneath my shirt, I pull out a rubber chicken and do the Kareem Abdul-Jabbar sky hook. And I sky hook a rubber chicken in the ring. <laughs> Unbeknownst to Jim the Neville Neidhart, who looks, at, looks down at the rubber chicken, looks up at me, and <laughs> Reckless Youth perfectly times the schoolboy to where he got, he looks up and then all of a sudden he's, he's rolling backwards one two three and i'm just like oh blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so, so we get back to the locker room and i'm sitting there in my you know wait you know sitting in the door waiting and jim comes in you know straps down he goes huh meanie robber chicken huh <laughs> <laughs> And the, the whole locker room popped because it was, you know, it was a rib, but it was a harmless rib. Yeah. And, uh, you know, morale was down and it popped the boys and made the boys laugh and, uh, no harm, no foul. But he's like, no, he's straight. Uh, rubber chicken, huh? Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's funnier. The, uh, the, the thought of throwing a rubber chicken to Jim Danville and I heart or the, the fact that watching him catch it register what he was actually catching looking up at me and as soon as he looked up at me he was he was, he was rolling backwards into a, a one two three you know situation <laughs> the last question for the day is from dr van halen md this is a music question for you which i know you love and i know you love talking yeah. about van halen of course thoughts on the proposed van halen tour with joe satriani alex van halen and david lee roth i am on the fence but I think Nuno Betancourt would be a better pick than Satriani. 
Yeah, I, I like Joe Santriani, but he's kind of like the Benny G of guitar players. He's very good at what he does, but it's just like vanilla, you know, just, right. uh, you know, I was a big fan of Joe Santriani with the uh, Surfer with the Alien album and stuff like that. And like, holy shit, how do you do that? But just, um, yeah, Nuno definitely would have been a better choice. But what do I feel about the proposed tour? Uh, in the meantime, uh, you know, since all this, you know, a story leaked out by Jason Newstead that, you know, former Metallica that he was approached by Alex Van Halen to kind of do like a tribute to Eddie. And people are like, I don't know. And then, but Joe Santriani came out and said, yeah, we're all kind of approached about doing a tribute to Eddie. You know, it would be Alex. Uh, Jason Newstead, uh, Joe Santriani, and Dave. And, uh, you know, eventually it fizzled out. It was just in the talks. But, you know, recently, you know, as of last night, Wolfgang came out and said, you know, there's there's no Van Halen without that. And I appreciate that. But it's like eventually somebody's got to do a tribute show. You know, I think they should rent out. You know, whatever the Staples Center is now. Say, rent out the Staples Center. I have a one night thing where a bunch of different artists get up and collaborate and do tributes to Eddie. Uh, you know, they kind of did something like that for, you know, Chris Cornell when Chris Cornell passed away. And they had a bunch of artists get up and do some of his solo stuff, some of his rage stuff, some of his audio slave stuff. You can get like, a bunch of different people, you know, like get like a country artist, get a rapper, get, get you know, whoever. And, you know, yeah. you can have a bunch of different people. I mean, cause Eddie Van Halen's influenced decades of, of folks. Van Halen as a band has influenced decades of people and you can, you know, cover, you know, Sammy and Dave stuff and Hey, throw a Gary song in there too. But, uh, yeah, I definitely think there should be, one big blowout tribute show to Eddie. Right. And uh, just a night of celebration, you know, because we didn't really get that because of the, the shutdown. But now that the world's opening up, you know, have yeah. one. Uh, and, you know, uh, I don't know where you could air it on, you know, pay-per-view or, you know, stream some streaming service or, you know, maybe HBO would want to pick it up, you know, or something yeah. like that. And just have a big, big celebration to Eddie. He deserves it. You know, I mean, he influenced an entire generation of guitarists. I mean, for Christ's sake, of course he does. But I, I kind of agree with Wolfgang. I, I don't know yeah. if I necessarily want to see a van, a proper Van Halen reunion tour because, right. f- like, he's right. I mean, there is no Van Halen without Eddie. It just doesn't feel right. You know, it's right. It's, it's a lot for me. It's a lot like when Stone Temple Pilots you know, replaced uh, a Scott Weiland or when uh, yeah. if they were or even like Sublime with Rome. It feels weird. Yeah. It feels weird yeah. without Bradley in the group. And it's just like, oh, this isn't yeah. really sublime. This is something different, you know? And I, I just, I have a hard time. Blind Melon did the same, Blind Melon did the same thing. Well, right. There's a yeah. uh, Drowning Pool is another great example. It's like, you know, it's it's this weird dynamic that people play. And, it, it, you know, that, that comes into play when you replace a founding member of the group. And it's like, ah, oh, it's just not the same. Um, right. And I, I thought I had heard that David Lee Roth was, like, officially retired from touring as yeah. well. So I, yeah, I imagine. The, yeah. It's, it's, it's the whole, I think it was like a, a concept that they were talking about and people are blowing it up bigger than what it is kind of thing. Right. You know? Right. You yeah. There's s- definitely, there's definitely not a Van Halen without Eddie. And if I'm Alex, you know, dude, you, the last time you played drums in public was with your brother, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, but, you know, should they do a tour? Eh, no, nah, but have a one night celebration, you know, where everybody comes out. I'm sure you could get Metallica to play it. Yeah. You could get all, you could get every band in the world to come or you could have some, uh, dream team type scenarios where different people, you know, yeah, a couple fantasy super groups could get together and jam- kind of like, kind of like the Freddie Mercury uh, thing, you know, where, you know, you know, Queen plays and, you know, David Bowie gets up and sings. Or, right. 
Annie Lennox gets up and starts singing, you know. Or yeah, it's just there's so many so much well, the, you could do. The whole rock and roll rock and roll hall of fame with uh, Tom Petty and Steve Winwood. Yeah. Like that is there's so many that's, different ways you can go with that. Yeah. That's per that's the perfect analogy. This is a, a, a huge jam session. Man, that and, if if you've never heard that before, I know we both have, but if you've never heard that fucking jam before. <laughs> Holy oh my gosh! Shit, man! Just, they didn't think Prince it. was gonna play up until right before he walked out on stage. Like they were, they asked him to do it. He agreed to do it. He didn't show up to rehearsal. He didn't show up to like the sound test. And he's literally standing on the side of the stage, just watching everybody play. And at the very last second, you can see him almost like throwing the guitar on. And he went out and fucking raged. All did only what only Prince could do. And, and the best part is watching like watching the other musicians on stage just stand there in awe of what Prince does. And then when Prince is done, he just throws his guitar in the air and it just disappears and he walks off stage. They, they were <laughs> they, I remember watching something about it or reading something about it after Prince passed and they couldn't find the guitar. They were like, That's no, no one we don't know what happened to the guitar. It went up into the air and it never came back down. We just, we don't know where it went. So That's um, awesome. One more question for you, a real quick one before we wrap up. Little Jimmy from Nebraska wants to know, hey, Meanie, when are you getting your sweet new kicks? Oh man! Uh, shout out to uh, Jim Nelson at GOI Kicks for uh, making the custom BWO uh, Nikes that he's making for us. Um, yeah, man, I, I posted some photos on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, he Jim does such great work. He does shoes for. He's made sneakers for Wu Tang. He made shoes for uh edge christian or i mean edge uh and beth phoenix who've worn them in the ring he did sho shoes for uh dave Chappelle. uh there's something about you know craftsmanship that i love watching and uh he's been sending you know progress photos and uh it's it's awesome it's got the bwo logo on it and on the soles of the shoe there's a photo of the BWO in the sole of the shoe. Oh, cool. Yeah. And uh he he's been working on it for a while. I mean, he's not just working on it. He's he's working on a bunch of different stuff, but he offered to do this for us. And uh I still can't believe they're gonna be a reality. But uh, uh there's no timetable on when I get him yet, but it's just a matter of uh when I get him how how I I want to display him because I don't even know if I can Maybe I'll wear them once, <laughs> just to see, take photos, and then they you know, put them in the in the under glass or something to keep them uh, preserved, you know. But there are going to be three of three. There's only going to three, be three people who own these sneakers. That's amazing. And they're uh, handmade, custom made by the folks at uh, G O I Kicks and uh, Jim Nelson, who makes them, who does an amazing job. I can't wait to check them out. I can't wait to see them, uh, Mini. But I also I'm always grateful to have you here to do another show this week. Likewise. Together. Where can everybody find you on social media? If you would like to stalk the Blue Meanie, uh, you can find me across <laughs> all platforms, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok, which I kind of haven't figured out yet. But uh, go to Blue Meanie, BWO, uh, across all social media platforms. If you would like to support the Blue Meanie, go to ProWrestlingTees.com slash Blue Meanie. If you would like to support Mind of the Meanie, go to ProWrestlingTees.com slash Mind of the Meanie. If you would like the blue guy to send you a message, um, you could go to ProWrestlingTees.com slash Mind of the Meanie and do a request a shoot video. Or you could go to Cameo.com slash Blue Meanie. And uh, I just did a couple the other day. Uh, birthday wishes, graduations, whatever you can think of. Speak be fun, be creative. Go to cameo.com slash blue meanie BWO. Uh, if you want to look good and smell good with your facial hair, go to madcatbeardcare.com. Again, uh, you know, I have the blue spruce there over on, at madcatbeardcare.com. And every dollar that you spend at madcatbeardcare.com, that money goes to helping uh, cats. So if you're a cat lover like myself, uh, help the kitties out. Uh, so go to madcatbeardcare.com and get yourself some blue spruce. But most importantly, Mr. Bernard, where can we find you? 
Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at this is Goober. Yes, it is my handle. Yes, I'm keeping it. It's a brand, pal. You can also check out my uh, other show, Foundation Radio, by going to foundationradio.net. You can also follow the show on Twitter at FND Radio Pod. Pick up a shirt and support the show at uh, prowrestlingtees.com slash foundation radio. You help keep the lights on here. Don't forget to sign up at patreon.com slash mind of the meanie. Get to see us here in our beautiful faces every week. Record the show early and ad free here. Uh, don't forget to sign up in Real Daddy Josh Chernoff's show. Uh, for So Says Chernoff, go to patreon.com slash so says Shurn off blue meanie i want to thank you again for your time as always it's always a pleasure to see you and the pod squad every week for the blue meanie i am adam bernard join us again each and every week as we take a trip through the mind <laughs> of the meanie it's the shits i can't remember what regular air smells like blip, 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 blue blue world order This episode of Mind of the Meanie was recorded and produced by Adam Barnard and was engineered by Carl Pinnell. Additional production and narration provided by Sam Kreps. Our executive producers are Josh Chernoff, Adam Barnard, and the Blue Meanie. Our opening theme is performed by the Swamp Candles. Our closing theme is performed by Chikara. The show contains original music produced by Enrichment. Get additional bonus content by becoming our patron on Patreon at patreon.com slash mindofthemeanie. And follow us on Twitter and Instagram at mindofthemeanie. This has been a Butts Carlton Media Production in conjunction with the MLW Radio Network. Butts Carlton Proprietor. Blue, 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 blue world order. That was Blue Meanie's brain out. The world of MLW Radio never stops.